Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Paul Romer. Paul is the Stanco 25 Professor of Economics in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's the founder of Applia, which develops and applies technologies for improving student learning. And his research has revolutionized the theory of economic growth. And that's our subject for today. Paul, welcome to Econ Talk. This is great to be here. Paul, let's start by talking about the importance of growth, as you do in your article for the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics. Uh, you have an article there, Economic Growth. Why do small changes in growth rates matter? Uh, sh- what's, what's important about that? Yeah. This is, this is a classic application of the power of compounding. That if you have a slightly higher, higher growth rate, then those growth rates, when they compound over many years, lead to dramatically higher levels of, levels of income. So, uh, for example, at 2.1% rate of growth per year, income per capita in a nation can increase by a factor of about eight over 100 years. So if, it's a big increase. Yeah. So if income per capita is up $30,000 per person in the United States, just round numbers, in 100 years it could be $240,000 per, per person. Now, imagine you had a slightly faster growth rate. Suppose it was 2.6% instead of 2.1%. Then it could increase by a factor of 13 instead of uh, 8. So you'd end up with $390,000 per person instead of 30, instead of uh, 240. 240. So Huge difference. Almost small, twice as much. Yeah. So small differences, five, half a percent per year, accumulate into very large differences in standards of living. And those, no matter what a nation wants to do with those extra resources, spend it on education, spend it on more vacations, more quality time with each other, uh, whatever it wants to do with those resources, having those more, having those additional resources will um, make make life better for everyone in the in the nation. Now, how much richer are we in the United States than we were a hundred years ago? How have we been doing? Well, I picked I picked the two point one percent because that's about the average rate of growth that we had over the the last century, and we did experience about an eightfold increase over over a period of uh, hundred years uh, per capita. Yeah, so it's a really a just phenomenal increase um, and something that's unprecedented in human history. We've never seen the leading nation in the world grow at uh, such a such an astonishing rate. Now, if you listen to the news reports, you'll know that there's some places like China, which are growing at ten or eight and ten percent per year. Twelve, sometimes yeah. here. But um, but that's because they're catching up with the frontier and they're starting from way behind. So when you start from a low base, it's always easy to have a faster rate of growth. But when as they start to catch up with us, uh, their growth rates will slow down. I mean, they're so. not going to pass us in five or six years. Per capita? Uh, certainly not <laughs> going to pass us in five or six years, no. And, and they might not pass us ever. I understand. Uh, we, we've had historical episodes where the United States started out below the, the UK. That's also why I picked a half a percentage point change. We grew over the 20th century by about a half a percentage point more per year than the, than the Brits. And we went surging ahead of them in terms of income per capita. So sometimes a nation that's behind can grow faster and can go surging ahead of... Um, of what was then the leading technology nation in the world. But, but right now, uh, the United States is still a real powerhouse in terms of the de- development of technology and sustaining growth. You picked China as an example, and you said their base was low, so it's easier for them to, while well, they're catching up, to grow at a faster rate. But it's not just that their base was low. It has something also to do with the reason that their base was low, which was the, the, both the institutions and the technology that they were using in the, at that low level, correct? That's right. Because I'm interested in that, that American example. Why do you think we've grown at a faster rate in America over the last 100 years than England? Mm-hmm. Technological uh, opportunity in both countries are relatively similar. Mm-hmm. We don't have access to secret technology that they didn't know to use. Uh, what are some of the reasons they might have grown more slowly than we did? Mm-hmm and other nations, for that matter, over the same period. Yeah. Well, let, let me answer a, a different question and then come back to that one. So the, the easy qu- question to answer is, why is China growing so fast? If you look back when the United States was at the same level that China is at, 
uh, we were growing more slowly. How can, they can, how can they grow so fast? Well, they have the advantage of being able to import, essentially just copy technology that already exists in places like the U.S. and adopt it very rapidly. So when they opened up their economy, they could rapidly take advantage of things that were already known. Now, the question about the U.S. versus the U.K. is a harder question about not copying things that are already known, but developing brand new things. And in the United States, we developed a set of institutions. Institutions are the rules that, kind of the rules of the game that structure what everybody does in the nation. We developed a set of institutions which encouraged more rapid discovery. We discovered and implemented things more rapidly than, uh, uh, than they did in the UK. And the interesting question that historians and economists are still struggling with is, what were the precise details of our institutions that made them better, just enough better to get an extra half a percentage point per year compared to the, com compared to the British? Of course, one of the reasons that we were able to do it is that we import people. Mm -hmm. You talked about China importing technologies. We import it mm -hmm. because of our op relatively open borders. We've imported a lot of smart people mm -hmm. from overseas that have helped us. But I want to stop before we get into that and, and ask you to clarify, I think, something a little, a little more basic. You attribute the growth in the United States, uh, the growth rate in the United States being above that of England's to our ability to develop new stuff. Yet, how important is it for a nation to be the, the developer rather than the, the importer? Uh, do we really care if the television was invented in the United States versus Russia? Do we really care where the car was invented or where the next great breakthrough comes from? Does it, does it matter? Yeah, no, we don't, and it's a really it's a really good point to to emphasize. When people often use these national comparisons as if it's a race where there's winners and losers, and I often tell my students, anytime you're thinking about rivalry between countries, reframe the question as rival rivalry between states in the United States. Like, would it would it upset us if uh, we lived in Illinois and Intel was making microprocessors in California? Like, is it bad for us? that Intel develops microprocessors. And of course not, you know, we, we're glad they make them and we're happy to use them. And Because uh, they uh, sell them relatively inexpensive. They, they sell them cheap, we get the benefits from using them. So, and does it make people in Illinois any worse off if um, people in, in California grow, grow richer or develop new technologies? Absolutely not, we're better off. People in Illinois are better off being able to trade with California and people in California are better off being able to trade with people in Illinois and New York and the, the rest of the country so that, um, this notion that there's a kind of a uh, rivalry with winners and losers when we think about nations is really very misleading about the underlying economics. This, this, by the way, was one of the advantages the United States had in the early part of the 20th century, is that we were already a big free trading block when a lot of the world was still relatively closed. And we had, yeah, well, we had, we had a big physical area. It, well, I'm not sure how... About our well, level of population and human capital at the beginning of the 20th century. Do you have thoughts yeah, on that? I, I think I think that we we were already overtaking Britain on population by around the, the turn of the century, okay. and then certainly grew faster as the 20th century sure. progressed. Well, so. I, we're going to come back and, and talk about the importance of population and, and human capital. I hope a little bit uh, a little bit later. So I, we we digressed there for a moment. We were talking about how important growth rates are and how the U.S. Uh, could pass England, but it's less likely that China will pass the United States purely on the basis of the fact that they're currently growing, growing at a fast rate. But l let's get to the, to the more basic question, which we've been uh, s starting to talk about, which is how do economists look at growth, uh, and how has the answer to the question of what causes growth changed over the last 25 or 50 years in the profession? Um, give, give me your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, the, the basic economic analysis, starting with Adam Smith and certainly with Malthus, who, who came afterwards, was an economics based on physical objects, um, notions of scarcity. Uh, if you have a plot of land or a piece of wood, um, only one person can use it, and there's a finite number of those pieces of wood and plots of land. Um, <clears throat> economists recognized that there were other things out there besides physical objects, things like ideas, a formula or a recipe for how to rearrange physical objects and make them more valuable. For a long time, they recognized that those formulas or insights or ideas were extremely important and that we were discovering more of them over time and that discovery was driving growth. But they felt like we didn't have the economic tools 
to study that process of discovery or technological change the way we studied the market for corn. So economists said, let's just set aside the question of where technology comes from. And they made up this, fa this highfalutin jargon to, to cover up for their, igno their ignorance in this area. They, they said, let's treat technological change as exogenous. It comes from outside the economic system. We don't know where it comes from and why, but given that there's technological change, let's study how an economy transforms scarce resources like iron ore into tractors and forklifts and structures and so forth. So we studied capital, we studied labor. We didn't pay much attention to the um, underlying process of technological change. We didn't really pay much attention to the what you call the recipe, which, I, which is a metaphor that, I, that you use in your article, Economic Growth, and that it is really a very powerful way for thinking about it. Um, we had a thing called the production function, mm -hmm. which is really the ultimate black box, right? We right. said, we take capital and labor, we put them together, and you get output. Right. We didn't really have much, until recently, we didn't think much about what was going on inside that black box. I mean, we realized mm -hmm. there were things called factories. Yeah where the capital and labor were combined in different ways, different materials, yeah. different things yeah. came out of the box. But the whole idea of creativity and innovation um, was not really yeah. considered. You know, I think part of why this question attracted me was because of my background in physics. And to a physicist, the whole, whole notion of a production function sounds wrong because we don't really produce anything. Everything was already here. Yeah. So all we can ever do is rearrange things. You think of conservation of mass. That's a great way. We get the same that. amount of stuff we've always had, but the world is a nicer place to live in because we've rearranged it. It's kind of uh -huh. like we, we fixed up the house, and yeah. it's like nicer now that we've, we've fixed it up. So then you have to think about, well, what is rearranging? Well, rearranging involves connecting things or modifying them chemically or, or structurally. Um, but then you realize, well, there's recipes or formulas you, you use to do that rearranging, or even like in cooking. Take the same raw materials in the kitchen, you can create something that's like a souffle, which is really valuable. It gives us great pleasure when we eat it. Or it could be like sour milk, and it's, uh, right. it's no, egg. no good at all. A little, yeah. little, less, <laughs> little less poetic, a little yeah. less romantic. Yeah. So, that, so that thinking about ideas makes you also think about how do we actually create value in an economy. And it also helps you think about questions of sustainability. It's not that we're using up raw materials and uh, we're going to run out of them at some point. It's really that there's a lot of stuff like this huge tinker toy set we've got to play with. And we can rearrange things and take them from states where they're not very valuable and rearrange them into configurations that are worth much more to us. Let me stick with that metaphor. Um, when, when you and I were in graduate school uh, ages ago for me, I think a little less long ago for you, but... Uh, a while back, there was this article, this idea that this isn't the way it was phrased, but there was sort of you combined capital and labor, and for a while you got a big kick, mm -hmm. and then after a while it kind of you hit this thing called diminishing returns, and you yeah. hit the steady state, mm -hmm. and this recipe idea. To add one more <laughs> metaphor, uh, you could think of it as. Um, you know, there's low-lying fruit. They're easy things to think of that are productive about the way you combine things. And then you get to the subtler, mm -hmm. eventually you figure out some more subtle things. But that clearly isn't the way the world works. Yeah. Because we wouldn't grow at 2.1% per capita year in, year out, if, if there were diminishing returns in the low-lying fruit sense of where... Yeah. People have already thought of the wheel. Oh, gosh, that all would the, have been all great. All the good stuff. The yeah. good stuff's been discovered. All yeah. that's left now is yeah. mint-flavored floss. <laughs> Adding mint to the floss, it's a breakthrough, right? No one yeah. combined those things. It's a new recipe. Right. But it just uh, it's not going to add so much to the pile of goods and services. And yet, yeah. the pile of goods and services grows in a healthy way, even though it's a very large pile now. Yeah. So wh why is that? Well, well, let me just emphasize a point you started with, which is that the notion of diminishing returns is very important. And none of this new work overturns diminishing returns explain what in, I in meant the by, traditional sense. Explain what I meant yeah. by diminishing returns, because <clears throat> I didn't say it very well. So, well, if you think of an activity like moving goods around in a distribution center. So goods come in from, a ware from manufacturers, and then the distribution center gets them on different trucks and sends them out to stores. So you could run a distribution center with 100 workers and just one forklift. And the first forklift would be really valuable for moving the heavy things. Then you could add a second forklift, and that would still add some real value, let you get a lot more done in that distribution center. 
But by the time you've added the 30th or the 40th or the 50th fork, uh, forklift, each additional forklift is really not helping you very much. It might, so, might merely be sitting off to the side in case yeah. one broke down. So yeah. There'd be some advantage to having the extra one. But yeah, perfect. Yeah, so like holding in, in sort of reserve would be a low product, but a positive product way to use a forklift. So with fixed recipes for how you arrange things and adding more and more physical capital, you do run into diminishing returns. And economies which try to grow by just adding more and more forklifts eventually run into serious trouble. The Soviet Union tried to grow like that for a while with essentially no innovation but very heavy investment in physical capital and they grew for a bit because they started out short on capital but they rapidly ran into uh, diminishing returns from accumulating capital so so you have to keep discovering ideas and then then the interesting question you're posing is well is it getting harder and harder to discover new ideas because we found the good ones first You'd think or it is would it getting be. or is it getting easier and easier and <laughs> The, the debate, there's still an interesting debate that's going on there. Um, here, here's roughly where people seem to be coming out on this. To maintain a given percentage rate of growth, you've got to discover more things every year. Like if each discovery is worth X and you want to grow from 6% from a level of, say, $10,000 per capita, you've got to add $600 worth of value in, in, in new things. But if you want to grow at 6% when you're starting from $30,000 per capita, you've got to add a lot more new things. So what it looks like is, as we learn more, it's getting easier to discover new things. So somehow knowledge is building on itself. Newton had this great evocative phrase of, he can see farther because he stands on the shoulders of giants. But it's not quite getting easier fast enough to maintain a constant rate of growth. So it's as if we, we keep getting easier to, it keeps getting easier to discover new things, but instead of adding five, you know, last 100, 100 years ago, and we can add 10 now, it's more like we can add five before and we can add six or seven now. So that wouldn't be enough to keep growth going. So how have we, have we kept growth going at the same constant rate? And there what it looks like is we've been putting more and more people to work on the discovery process. So we've been training those people who do discovery more. They spend more years in education getting really good at using prior knowledge. So they're a lot more skilled than they used to be. But there are also more people worldwide who are engaged in the discovery process. And that that's had this very important, well, more people per capita in the United States doing discovery and more total people worldwide. So we're getting the combined effects of knowledge building on knowledge that makes it easier to discover and having more and more people all engaged in the discovery process and those two things together seem to explain why we've had growth rates which are actually getting faster over time not slowing down and you're totally talking about investment in what economists call human capital mm -hmm. the, i like you know better more accessible phrases the discovery process and you know, the traditional model of, of investment is you don't eat all your seeds. You mm -hmm. put some aside for fruit tomorrow or seeds tomorrow. And it, as we get wealthier as a world and wealthier as a nation in the United States, do we choose and are we able to afford more folks doing the looking around? The, it's basically the investment, the giving up of consumption today for consumption tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Well, part, part of what's happened, if you think back to 100 years or 150 years ago, the, the people who would have said the sky is falling would have said, we're going to destroy all these jobs in agriculture. And you've got right. the vast majority of the labor force was engaged in agriculture. About 40% in 1900. Where, yeah, where are we ever going to find jobs for all of those people? Well, what we've done is we've educated their children, their children and grandchildren. And, grandchildren. Yeah. and many of those those people are now engaged in discovery of better ways to better ways to, to do things. So as productivity has has grown, we freed up human resources, which really is in some sense the scarcest commodity, the sort of the power of the of the human intellect. We freed up more of that power to to engage in this discovery activity. We're so wealthy, in fact, we can even have people spending their time listening to podcasts, figuring out how growth occurs, which is uh, which is a glorious, uh, glorious yeah. thing. Yeah. Well, you talk about uh, the role of meta-ideas, and surely that's part of the way that we're able to continue yeah. to leverage human knowledge and creativity mm -hmm. beyond just having to discover those extra new ideas given that yeah. we're, we're, we're 
were bigger. Talk about what you mean by meta ideas. So to, so to recap, we're, we've maintained accelerating growth over time, partly because the more we know, the easier it gets to discover. But we've also maintained it because we've got more and more people pitching in on this discovery activity. Now, how did we get more and more people pitching in on discovery? Some of that has come purely from population growth. There are just more people around. But the most important part of it has come from changes in our institutions. We have things like universities, and we have things like patent laws, and we have things like research grants, which have created incentives for those individuals to engage in more, uh, more discovery. So the institutions are, again, the, the, the rules of the game create incentives, and we've found ways to create incentives for people to do more discovery. So, so a meta idea is something like the modern research university. It's an idea that helps us get better at discovering ideas. So when we essentially invented the modern research university with the creation of the, the land grants uh, university system in the United States with the, the Morrill Act in 1870s, we, we created a whole new idea discovering system with these universities that were focused on very practical problem solving uh, tasks rather than abstract ivory tower examination of the of the classics you know the, the classical activity at a place like oxford was to study greek Aristotle, manuscripts yeah. the 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 universities in the united states created by the, the land grant system they were their job was to figure out how to grow more crops you know for better crop build a yields. bridge build a bridge <laughs> yeah. uh, the the football team at Purdue is still called the Boilermakers because engineers at Purdue used to work on railroad boilers. Oh, that's they, they, fantastic. They would, they, they would weld railroad, railroad boilers because boilers were very important technology for uh, transportation. Yeah, and of course it's kind of ironic because Purdue, maybe they're actually still interested in education. Their football team hasn't done very well. A lot of, <laughs> uh, historically, a lot of their, a lot of modern universities you might think were designed to create football teams rather than better bridges <laughs> and uh, and uh, boilers for railroads, uh, for uh, trains. Uh, but that's, that's, a, that's a great example. It's a wonderful example. Uh, how come other countries haven't copied it? Have they? Well, We seem to have invented a lot of the, uh, the cool meta ideas. A lot of we, our institutions are really unusual and extremely uh, productive. Yeah, so we, I think we did two we things. We being America. We in, we in the United States did two things that were complementary, that reinforced each other. Uh, one of those things was committing to what we were just talking about, education, uh, universal primary education, then universal secondary education, developing the university system, encouraging research. So we committed heavily to institutions of learning and discovery, but we also committed heavily to the market mechanism, to property rights, to free entry, to competition, to uh, just competition in, in all its many forms. The interaction between those two systems, so the institutions of the market, and broadly speaking, the institutions of science, we got both of those right. And it's the combination of those two which has been so powerful. And many nations of the world have tried to push the institutions of science alone in the, lear in the learning, but have been slower to adapt to adopt the full institutions of the market. And uh, uh, even you know when we were when we were kids uh, when we were going through college, it was still an open question whether market systems would be better than sure. centrally planned economies. A lot of intelligent people thought central planning was a better system than the market. In our lifetimes, everybody has been con virtually everybody's now been persuaded of the power of the market system. Many institutions around the world still lag behind. Uh, where we are in the United States in terms of committing to uh, markets and uh, uh, competition. Well, the most dramatic example that comes to my mind is you hear that Cuba has a great educational system. You hear mm -hmm. that the Soviet Union in the, height of, in the heyday of communism had great scientific institutes, and yet many of the things they spent their time on were not productive, uh, you know, Lysenkoism, uh, right. dead ends in, in yeah. science that yeah. didn't face the market test and were yeah. uh, basically sinkholes for a resource to be poured into with no, out, with no, yeah. with no value produced. The, the Soviet Union is an interesting example of how powerful a force competition can be. 
So where, where was the Soviet Union closest to the technology frontier? It was actually in military equipment. You know, a, MiG, a MiG fighter jet was not a bad airplane. Right. Why, was, why was that good and their washing machines were terrible? Well, the, the MiGs had to compete with, with US. They, they were worried about competing and thought hard about competing and staying up with U.S. fighter technologies. So competition can show in many different ways, and it clearly stimulates uh, better performance, new discovery, better productivity uh, from, from all sides. So a lot of the world has yet to really embrace competition in its uh, uh, in all of its uh, power and uh, discomforts, because it is discomforting sometimes as well as being powerful. Now, I think one of the great advantages we have in the United States is a culture, we have many cultural advantages in the competitive system, the cultural norms that I think reduce transaction costs for buying and selling, and I think it's very important, but uh, one of the other things we have a cultural advantage is, is a tolerance for change. Mm -hmm. uh, that apparently Europe, for example, doesn't appear to have. It may, that may be masked yeah. by political forces that make it hard to figure out what their real preferences are. Mm -hmm. But on the surface, they appear to have more of a taste for security than rather than dynamism, and that yeah. seems to handicap them tremendously. Or, or preservation. Yeah, I sometimes tell my students that that everybody's in favor of growth, but nobody wants change. And yeah, you can't, you can't. You can't have it both ways. Yeah, that, that's a that's a a tough lesson to swallow, um, but it, it'll be interesting to see how Europe copes. Is the yeah. if we're right, I, I think we are that that their desire for security is going to the costliness of that is going to become increasingly apparent, and we'll be interesting to see how they cope with that politically. It, I'm sure I'm sure many of your your listeners are young people, possibly college students, and I think it might help to give a little bit of historical perspective on this. I was talking with uh, uh, somebody my age from France. And he was describing the thought processes, what the French were thinking in the 70s and the 80s. And even in the 1970s, their reaction was, how could you possibly have many different phone companies? And how could people even decide which phone company to use? Wouldn't that be chaotic? Of course the government has to run the phone company. Right. And uh, so even in the last uh, 30, 40 years, um, now the whole world has seen the power of cell phones. There's parts of, my daughter lived in India last year. She could get cell phone service out in the middle of India because instead of having to wait from the government telephone provider to put a telephone line in, which took decades in some of these countries, private companies, competing private companies entered and they put cell phone towers all over, all over India. So much of the world in our lifetimes has gone from thinking competition would be this chaotic, wasteful process to recognizing that this is how we, we produce a higher quality of life. So to go back to our narrative about the evolution of the way economists think about growth, we started off with this idea that physical things mattered, ca adding capital, adding machinery mm -hmm. to people to make them more productive, and clearly that was part of the story. Mm -hmm. But in recent years, your work and, and that of others has, has focused on ideas. Yeah and the power of innovation, of human creativity. What are the policy implications that, that you think are relevant for both the United States, a, a country that has a, a very successful growth record, and for poorer countries that would like to emulate the United States' rate of growth? Yeah. Well, if, if it's okay, let, let's spend a minute talking about institutions and the, the role they have mm -hmm. uh, in fostering ideas as opposed to um, trading objects, and then we'll get to the policy okay. implications. Sure. So, so when we, we looked at, we, we recognized, okay, discovery is something where it, incentives matter, and if we create the right institutions, people will do more of it. And what was missing was a simple economic theory that could describe that process. And that was where endogenous growth theory, the kind of growth that I worked on, came in. We tried to create models where people had an incentive to go out and discover things like ideas, not to, dis, not to do things like dig up uh, another uh, cubic yard of, of iron ore. When we looked at that, we noticed that, that ideas differ in this very fundamental way from a scarce resource like iron ore. And so the optimal institutions that we'd use for fostering the production and distribution of ideas are somewhat different from the optimal institutions for, for iron ore. With iron ore, there's this just wonderful, miraculous result from Adam Smith that one price can serve two jobs. It can motivate the, uh, the production of an additional unit of a good, and it can allocate that good to the right person. So, so take something like ethanol. If you're using the price system correctly, it'll tell you whether or not we should make ethanol and use it as a fuel, and the price, the same price, you can use it to decide who should, who should get that ethanol. 
um, as, as an aside, we don't use the price system for ethanol. No, we, we actually don't. use it's heavily distorted with subsidies, and we might actually scientists aren't sure, but we might actually be destroying energy every time we make a unit of ethanol. But if we if we did use the which price be, system, which would be impossible to do for any extended period of time under a price system, if we had a price system, right, that wouldn't happen. And so it really is. We just take it for granted, but it's remarkable and it's a subtle mathematical fact that one price can do two very different jobs for something like a gallon of ethanol. Now, it turns out that's what doesn't work with an idea. So take some really valuable idea. My, my favorite really valuable idea is something called oral rehydration therapy, which is this, this formula, this insight for how to save the lives of kids who get diarrhea. Turns out that many of them, will they'll die of dehydration if you don't give them fluids. And if you just give them water, or even give them just water plus a little salt in it, they'll actually get an electrolyte imbalance and die. But if it turns out if you mix a little bit of glucose, a little bit of sugar, along with the salt and the water, you can save just millions of lives. So this, good is, a, thing. Good yeah, idea. this is a really good, good idea. idea. <laughs> Literally millions of lives from figuring out just a simple formula for mix some sugar in with the salt and a few minerals of water. Primitive, yeah. nothing sophisticated, doesn't yeah. involve titanium. Yeah, right. <laughs> or, 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 or Moore's Law. You know? Right, exactly. Um, now, what's the right price for a discovery like that? Well, society should be willing to pay a huge amount to have somebody go discover something like that because it can save so many lives. But then what's the right price for deciding who gets to use it? Well, once that idea is discovered, the efficient price for that idea is zero because there's no cost associated with using it. Or another way to say it is there's no, there's no congestion. If we, had, um, if we had a field, a pasture, and we let everybody use it for free, we know what happens. You get the tragedy of the common pasture. It gets overused, you get congestion, you get, you get waste. You thin, gra thin yeah. grass, and eventually it might even be totally denuded of all grass. But there's no tragedy of the intellectual commons. There's no overuse or congestion from having everybody use an idea once it's, once it's discovered. And, and let's emphasize, we're talking here about using the idea, not the glucose, yep. not the, sh not the sure. salt, not the yep. water, just yeah. the knowledge. Yeah. So the any, knowledge is... is yeah. Any good recipe will have to have some ingredients, and the ingredients are just standard old economic goods and standard analysis supplies, but the idea itself um, has a diff this different characteristic. So... So what we created were models that didn't rely on the classical institutions of perfect competition. We brought in models that had to achieve some kind of a, a compromise. Some kinds of ideas we might want to treat like oral rehydration therapy and make them public goods. So you might have the government pay for a, a research project to discover an idea like this. And then once it's discovered, we give it away for free. So that's, that's the kind of difference. Public, which means, for example, publishing it, publishing the recipe, Publish it in a, telling in a people how much glucose, putting it in a pamphlet, it's how a, much it's, glucose. It's, it's on a web, website. On just, a website. Just Google oral rehydration therapy. You can read everything you want to know about it. Um, so so it, it's interesting how we talked before about the institutions of the market and the institutions of science. It's interesting how different they are. The market, the most important idea in the market is the notion of a property right. You give somebody an ironclad right over something like uh, a piece of land, they get to decide, and then that right lasts forever. They get to decide what to do with that land. But an idea in science, it's the opposite of, of a property right. You say, we'll reward you for publishing and giving away and renouncing any property rights, any control over an idea if you come up with something really, really valuable. So we have these two extremes of the institutions of the market and the institutions of science. And what's really interesting at the policy level, finally getting back to your policy question, is where, where do most of the interesting ideas lie? Should we treat them more like the market or should we treat them more like science with strong property rights like the market and ownership or weak property rights like the market? And like, excuse me, weak property rights like science. And I think where we've come out in the United States is a kind of a healthy middle point where we assign some kinds of property rights and control over most discoveries so for most new things you discover, you can go out and potentially become a wealthy person if you come up with a better idea. So we give some property rights. It might be a patent. It might be a copyright. Maybe it's just secrecy. You can keep people from copying you. But it's not a perfect property right. It doesn't last forever like a, your ownership of land. Somebody can copy you. They can start to compete with you. The ideas leak out. So where we've settled for most ideas is in the middle between pure systems of the market and the pure system of science. Well, you said they don't last forever. That's true unless you're 
talking about Mickey Mouse, or it just appears to last forever. Yeah. Well, they keep they keep Congress extending, keeps extending the copyright. Yeah. But uh, I want to let me focus on this for a minute because I think it's it's a little bit confusing when we mix the policy. So we're, we're we're talking about two things here. So what's the ideal, and what are the fundamental nature of these things? The point you make in your paper, Endogenous Technological Change, which is a, uh, we'll put a link up to it on the web that, that some people would be able to get to. It's, um, it's an academic journal article. The, the last part of that article is it was only accessible to a, a graduate student or someone with a serious mathematics background, but the first part is very, uh, is fascinating to, to anybody, and it, there's a lot of interesting insights there. But you, what, what you talk about in the first part is this distinction between these physical goods and these intellectual goods. The, the idea that they're, um, the, the technical term is, is rivalrous. And the question is, only one person can use the iron ore at the, to- at the time, but an infinite number of people can use the oral rehydration recipe. Mm-hmm. The implication of that uh, is complex for, for, for what is the right institutional structure yeah. to put in place to encourage the discovery of, of these intellectual ideas that, are, mm-hmm. that, that, that more than one person can enjoy at the same time. Um, we, it's true that it's hard to make a living selling it once everybody knows what it is. It's mm-hmm. impossible to make a yeah. living selling it. So on the surface, it appears the economic incentives to discover these type of ideas are zero. But they're not zero because of secrecy. Mm-hmm. So, for example, to take the oral rehydration example, I can produce a, a bottled uh, solution of this stuff, mm-hmm. and let's assume, and this is an institutional example, let's assume there's no institution requiring me to reveal the ingredients, yeah. which would be one of the ways that we've made a trade-off mm-hmm. between returns, incentives, and spreadability. So there's no, ins- there's no labeling requirement, and I can make an immense amount of money. Yeah. Uh, and if I can't, because my the people I'm selling it to are poor, other people might not subsidize my my product, but transfer income to these folks to, to allow them to purchase my expensive, valuable uh, mm-hmm. solution. And we could be talking about pharmaceutical products sure. here, not just this example of, of oral yeah. rehydration therapy. So the fact that that it, that the idea is can be shared by many doesn't mean that it has to be shared by many. Now right. we we understand that the world will be a good place if it is shared by many. Mm-hmm. But isn't that where the tension is between providing the incentive to discover and then this price mm-hmm. playing two roles? Yep. But there are ways to solve that problem beyond, uh, in, there are many different ways to solve that problem, mm-hmm. correct? Yeah, yep. so, uh, so again, s- secrecy, as you suggested, in a market system, just secrecy alone can create important incentives. Go back to the story I was telling about the warehouse where you just had workers and forklifts. Uh, people at uh, Walmart actually developed an interesting idea about how to build uh, distribution centers. It's what they call cross-docking. So instead of just having one set of docks that some trucks would come up to and unload, and then another set of trucks would come up to and then load back up to go out to the stores, they put a building with docks on both sides of the building, on the, the east side and the west side. So one set of trucks would come up to the east side and they'd unload things from the, from the uh, manufacturers. And then they'd pick them up off those trucks and then drive them over to the other side of the building and put them on trucks going directly to the stores. And the efficiency advantage there was that you only pick things up once. Mm-hmm. You didn't pick them up once, set them down, and then pick them up again a second time. Good so, idea. Simple, simple good <laughs> idea, but it's part of how Walmart can deliver goods to people at lower price than anybody could before. Now, Walmart, people, can, people like Target and Kmart and Sears could see what Walmart was doing. They tried to copy it. Walmart knew a whole lot of details about how to get that system right. So the big picture idea could be copied. All the details were harder to copy. And Walmart's made a lot of money for the Walmart family and then the shareholders of Walmart by discovering little ideas like that, little, seemingly little, but, little, but very important economically, keeping them secret, running faster than the rest of the competition, and earning a real profit from it. But, but as I said, that kind of information leaks out over time. So eventually... Target catches up, they compete with Walmart. So what does Walmart have to do? Well, they got to go out and discover the next thing and move a little bit further ahead in productivity. And so that that kind of racing to stay ahead and discover new things is part of what drives the innovation machine here in the United States. And, and secrecy is like a patent with a finite life. Obviously, it's very hard. I mean, Coke mm-hmm. 
Coke had a formula for Coke that was supposedly a secret. Pepsi tastes similar to it, not yeah. exactly the same, and yeah. they're fans on both sides. But these examples of innovations, the, the return to them, they do get copied. Yep. They, secrecy can't be sustained for a long time. They do get copied. But what are the implications, in your opinion, because it's a very controversial area. Uh, you, know, you suggested that we have, the, we have a nice mix in the middle of the United States. Mm-hmm. We sort of grant some monopoly yeah. power. Yep. Uh, a lot of people suggest that's a mistake. And they work both ways. So they, they think we need a lot. Yeah. Y- you've said, you know, we started this podcast with you talking about the power of ideas. So some people argue we need a lot more incentives for ideas. We need to extend patents. We need to give mm-hmm. people longer lives, whether they're pharmaceutical companies, whether they're yeah. other types of innovations. Yeah. We want to create a big incentive for research and, incentive for research and development. Let's make uh, the monopoly rights bigger. Other yeah. people argued that's a mistake. Right. Let's get rid of all the monopoly rights. Let's get rid of patents. Get rid of them. Mm-hmm. And we'll let the market evolve other methods for protecting intellectual property and these ins- and create these incentives. Where do you, where do you come out on that? What do you think we know yeah. about it? It's a it's a it's yeah. a quaint area for intellectual um, uh, creativity. Well, do we it, know what it's saying? But it's ex- it's an extremely important Very area important. for the future of discovery and yeah. the quality of life. So it's great that people are excited <laughs> and interesting in theory. And, and for, for for us as economists. It's, it's sort of nice in a way, in a funny sort of way, to recognize there's some things where we don't know the answer. Mm-hmm. If, if the world were just made up of iron ore and physical objects, Adam Smith pretty much nailed it. And, you know, Most of it, there would yeah. be nothing left, you know, mostly Adam Smith. He didn't have Marshall. the Coase theorem. Yeah, right. But other than that, but, it's pretty good. Yeah, you know, so, though, so we know an awful lot about how to structure perfect competition in the world of physical objects. There's things we don't know about how best to get these institutions to do this trade-off between incentives and, and distribution. Now, um, I think one thing to recognize is that the right solution has got to be both a lot of stuff which is somewhere in the middle in, in the extremes, and then also some real tolerance for letting 100 flowers bloom to try lots of different systems. So let me take software, for example. Microsoft is still the dominant provider of software under the kind of property rights model. They have strong copyrights. They've got strong monopoly power. They've got a lot of incentives to develop their software system and a lot of market power. They can charge a a high price for their software compared to the cost of selling it to one person. So we've got a property rights solution for developing software. At the same time, we have the open source movement, which is actually developing software under the kind of no property rights system. And it's good that we've got both of those and they're competing, and it's not 100% clear who's going to win. There's different niches. Open source has decisively won the day in a few niches like web server software, that uh, the Apache web server is still the most widely used web server that serves up uh, web material uh, throughout the world. And that was developed purely by open source, no property rights, the the institutions of science. Just you get credit for improving the web, uh, the Apache system. On the other hand, the, the property rights solution from people like, like Microsoft seems to have been a better system for developing um, systems that are easy for lots of people to use. You know, geeks wrote systems that were easy for geeks to use, <laughs> yeah. but they just weren't, the interfaces just weren't as clever. I mean, take, it's not just Microsoft, it's Apple. Take Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs got a monopoly position in, in the Apple software. Jobs is not the open source system, although, ironically, Jobs has built on the back end, he used uh, Linux as the as the back end for the new operating system for uh, for Apple. But the front end was developed with some property rights, and you know they've come up with very very wonderful front ends for us to use music players and now phones and yeah. systems. So it's great to have a system that allows competition, as it were, between different systems of of, of innovation. So that's the one thing. There's not going to be a one size fits all answer. Uh, now, and if I if I can continue just for a second, the other is that um, there will be this this middle ground, even with something like Microsoft or Apple, or or pharmaceuticals. Even if we give people pretty strong property rights to let them, if they come up with a new drug or a new interface, you might want to let them have a control over that for for many years. But we wouldn't want to give somebody blocking power so that no subsequent innovation could ever take place without the permission of the initial property holder, or, because that could slow things down. You know, the monopoly control there could really dramatically slow slow things down. So the people who say the right solution is to go towards the extremes of really strong property rights, um, that they're probably wrong. And uh, a lot of economists and thoughtful people 
are worried about the tendency right now to try and push towards stronger and stronger property rights. I mean, imagine, imagine for example, that we'd given an infinite life property right to the person who came up with A minor, and nobody could play an A minor chord, yeah. you know, for the rest of human history without negotiating a contract with the great great grandchildren of whoever it was who came up with A minor. You know, it's kind of it sounds absurd, but yet, if we took extreme property rights to the limit. That's what could happen. You'd have to negotiate with the owner of every single different chord when you're trying to make a make a song. So these kinds of uh, uh, you know pushing to the extreme arguments help you see that even though infinitely strong property rights on land are a great idea, infinitely strong property rights on ideas could really hamstring future future innovators. And so we'll ultimately have to be in a position which is somewhere in the middle where. You can control something for a while, and you can control it for sale to consumers, but you can't stop somebody from coming along and coming up with an even better version down the road. So let me give you my worry. I think that was beautifully said. But what you've basically said is that, which is obviously true, that each case is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Depends on the nature of the innovation. Depends on the nature of the good. When we put this in the political process, I joked earlier about about Mickey Mouse having a very long life. Yeah. Uh, Mickey Mouse has a long life because Disney makes a lot of money off of Mickey Mouse. The fact that 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 creative people can't use Mickey Mouse without my, without Disney's <laughs> well said Microsoft. Mm -hmm. the, the, Disney is the Microsoft of, of entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, although their stuff's prettier. Mm -hmm. uh, although with my the fact that people can't use Mickey Mouse freely, it's not really a big loss of human welfare. But, but there's a lot of things that are a big loss. And is the, mm -hmm. the stakeholders, the, the, the holders of these, of these property rights, use the political process to protect them. I have no confidence, that mm -hmm. the very little confidence, that the political process will pick the right mix. Take one more example. Uh, I'm a big fan of universities, as clearly you are. We, we, mm -hmm. we make a large part of our living in them, and they're glorious, and there's wonderful things that happen here. And we've subsidized them tremendously in the United States, and there's a strong intellectual case for subsidizing them along the lines that you've talked about. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's an enormous amount of stuff that takes place here that has nothing to do with growth, yep. nothing to do with uh, uh, th these ideals that, that we're discussing, and they're just due to the fact that, that people can use the political process, be it the state house to get grants for their state <laughs> university or, mm -hmm. or at the federal level to favor their own particular flavor of stuff. Why would... Does that push you at all, as it does me, toward lower property rights for intellectual ideas because of the worries about public choice concerns? Yeah, I think um, I think that when you set a variable in, in somewhere in the middle, you try and set the dial in the middle, and you have people who have a huge stake in moving the dial one direction or the other, um, you're going to create large lobbying efforts and political dynamics that will move the dial in the direction of the people who have a very large concentrated stake. And they may not represent the interests of the, of the nation as a whole. So as we think about policies, it's very important to think about the political dynamic that you unleash when you try and create a policy uh, framework. So I think um, patents and copyrights have been an area where people had a lot at stake and they've really pushed, pushed in the direction of, of strengthening property rights, potentially going too far. Now, what, what's interesting right now is we're actually going through a correction in the area of patents. That patent pr protection, because of some re recent course, court cases, um, patent protection is actually, um, and even a little bit of discussion in the legislative area, although we haven't seen legislation yet, but the Congress has been talking about it, the courts have been responding. We're actually moving a little bit back towards the middle without making patents quite as strong as they were. So there is there are some restoring forces even the, in the political dynamic. So I, I don't worry quite as much about uh, and, and copyrights. You know, copyrights are not as damaging as, as patents if they sure. get out of, get out of control. So I'm not quite so worried about it, and I'm encouraged by the movements back towards slightly narrower uh, patents and slightly less kind of a threat given to patent holders. Um, but but it, this leads to a very interesting question, which is that. If you have weak property rights on discovery, we won't get as much discovery. What do you, what do you, what do you mean by that? Well, if, if somehow if we let people copy ideas, or even if patents expire after a certain period of time, or okay. or you know we make we move more towards the open source system for discovery. In general, the incentives 
the value to society for somebody to develop something new would be bigger than the value to that individual. They just won't capture all the value. Sure. So we as a society have, an, have a, a reason, we have a, there's a good reason why we might want to encourage more of that discovery. We'd like to create institutions. I mean, meta ideas here again. Let's come up with a meta idea that can help encourage discovery using our collective resources. So let's use the government to try and encourage discovery. Now, you could do that in ways which unleash strong lobby groups, or I think you can come up with ways to do it which are much less likely to create those kind of lobbying forces. And I think we should really focus on that issue when we decide what policies to adopt. So for example, I'm very big on government incentives which could reward students, young people, for going on and getting additional training in, say, science and engineering. Science and engineering training is great for the discovery process. I think the government should give out more grants to, to students to just pay for, like vouchers, to pay for their graduate education or even maybe their undergraduate education in science and engineering. But then once they've, once they've graduated, they just go out in the market and uh, try and dis discover new things. You don't we know don't, what they'll do, we don't but they'll we do don't, something clever. We don't tell them to go yeah. discover a hydrogen car. Yeah, we don't subsidize yeah. that. But now you can think about another system, which is, well, the government gives grants to firms for specific kinds of discoveries. And that raises two problems. One, can the government really pick the right things? And two, even if they can pick, it's going to create a lot of lobbying pressure from those firms who get those 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 grants. So you don't worry about lobbying pressure from the music department and the French department and the philosophy department for those science engineering grant vouchers. Well, well that's why I'd give them to the students because the students get to vote with their feet. If you, uh, well, actually, I would. Uh, I guess that's I would put a, a fence around this, yeah. which would say these students can go get a degree in science and engineering, but not in music or, or art history. But you know, that Start would doing be, the science of music. Yeah, yeah that would a be, lot of neuroscience and music on here at Stanford, actually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They claim well, that that was somebody. Will, somebody will have to draw, you know, <laughs> draw a line that says this is science and this is this is not. But but uh, I, I think it, it, it. If you look back in our history, we really benefited as a nation from subsidizing discovery and innovation. And as you said, universities were a good way to do that. Universities have dealt, developed, I think, some, you know, some. Uh, you know, some wasteful features. And I, I would like to shake things up a little bit. Part of the problem in universities right now is we give all the research subsidies to the professors and the students, the bright young students, you know, the Isaac Newton, the 24-year-old Isaac Newton of our day, can't get subsidies, can't get research dollars. They got to go cater to some right. they gotta old, jump through the old, old professor like me or you. Yeah. And, you know, we tell them to go work on some dumb thing we're, we're interested in. So I think, I, I think in innovation, it's great to to free up the young people, give them the resources and turn them loose. So I wish we developed, we devoted more of our support for innovation, not to universities, not to firms, but to uh, to young people who had lots of freedom. Well, it sounds like we need a new type of university. It sounds like a good project for the next 20 years of your life, Paul. Well, well if you gave students these portable fellowships, you can actually see entry of yeah. new universities because somebody came up with a better university, those students would actually go there and... Um, I think one of the reasons that we're so well paid relative to the average is the difficulty of entry, mm -hmm. both into our profession, but especially into the university. And it's hard to start new universities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, one of the reasons is because they do things unrelated to education mm -hmm. that are much more difficult to copy. They create yeah. identity and lifestyle experience that go well beyond the educational process. An interesting challenge. Well, well the the... the the, the three ways universities get money, research grants, alumni giving, and then tuition, the research grants and the alumni giving set up very serious barriers to entry. Yep. If we relied more on tuition, we could actually get more, more entry. And part of what vouchers you know, from governments to students, especially say in graduate education, uh, graduate education is funded almost not at all by tuition. If there were students out there with tuition dollars clamoring for graduate education, we might actually see some entry into you know, the creation of new, new fields of training. So, uh, well, uh, yeah, and graduate education would look more like uh, MBA training in the sense of its desire to cater to yeah. the consumer, which is missing yeah. from a lot of graduate yeah. education, as you point and, out. And worry if those people could actually get a job. Yeah, whether they liked it and whether you could attract more from them in the future, which would be related to getting a job. Yeah. You mentioned something in passing I want to come back to. Uh, you talk Actually, let me just stick with that point. Yeah. Just as an aside, 
Part of why I shifted from an economics department to a business school is I think business schools are somehow the model of how the world should look, that, that we as professors should live in an environment where tuition is an important part of the incentives that guide what, what we do. And so I wanted to just not just you know, talk the talk from often an economics department where you know, I could ignore students and tuition, but I wanted to come live and work in a business school and see if, if that really is the way um, more of higher education should look. But one of the great meta ideas of the last 20 years was the ranking of business schools. Mm -hmm. uh, business Week, uh, which ranks business schools, was the first, I think, organization if, to public widely rank, to rank business schools in a way that was widely shared. Um, their methodology has been criticized. It's silly. It's imperfect. And of course it is. But boy, did it shake up the world of graduate education and, and business, yeah. uh, mainly for the best, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I want to make something you mentioned in passing, uh, which intrigued me. You said, in the case of these ideas where there's weak property rights, uh, the inventors won't discover the value, excuse me, won't capture all the value, and therefore we don't get enough of it. And so we want to make sure there's ways to, to keep it going, subsidize it perhaps. Mm -hmm. But in the physical world, the, um, the less intellectual property scope of things, I guess this is still true of just patents, nobody captures the value. Nobody comes close to capturing the value of their, of their discoveries. And yet we get a ton of it. We get a ton of discovery. So I guess the yeah. question is, there's so many other motivations beside, besides money. There's pride and glory mm -hmm. and fame and mm -hmm. all the things that go with that that are often financial. Mm -hmm. So there are some things in place that, that keep those, inset, those discoveries coming, even in the absence of, just of capturing the right amount. Yeah. Th this was a point you mentioned earlier I meant to comment on, which is that even if we had no legal protection for ideas whatsoever, there's still lots of incentives for discovery. Some would come from secrecy, as you mentioned, you know, like cross-docking at, at Walmart. Some comes from uh, just reputation and uh, curiosity. So there, there are lots of things that will keep discovery going. What my claim is, is that if we can keep it going at a pretty exciting rate right now with reduced incentives, imagine how fast it could go if we just you know, just turned up the dial a little bit. Fair enough. But, but the, the challenge, the difficulty is in turning up the dial to really mix my metaphors, you could also strangle the golden goose. Yeah. You know, if you provided the subsidies in a way which bureaucratized the whole discovery process, you'd be, you'd be better off with no subsidies at all than creating this bureaucratic structure which sucks talent away from, you know, exciting things and puts them on to, to terrible things. So, so when, you, when I say that we could subsidize it and get more discovery, you have to approach that with a fair degree of caution and think about the political dynamics, but still recognize that things like when we provided, say, universal primary school education back early in our history, and universal secondary school education, and then subsidized uh, university education, part of what we did was we gave lots of people the, just the basic problem-solving analytical skills to go out and discover more effectively. And those kinds of investments really paid a huge return uh, for us as a nation. So those, I think, are pretty safe. What's, what's more problematic are these more targeted ones to particular firms, to particular areas, and I think we'd do well to stay away from those. We also raised the point earlier, and you, and you emphasize it in, in the endogenous technological change article, the role of the price system mm -hmm. in steering innovation. We don't just want innovation. Yeah. We want innovation that changes people's lives and makes them better and delights and, and mm -hmm. inspires and, and is more than just a new flavor of dental floss. And... If you rely on the non, it's an interesting question. I, no, I've never seen anything on this. If you rely on the non-market incentives, glory, fame, and mm -hmm. curiosity, I wonder how far you get in, yeah. Uh, yeah. in in appropriate types of. You can still get innovation. You don't get the same type. Well, so one example that I, I use that comes from some colleagues at, uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, uh, I think it was Bob Lucas, or perhaps uh, his his wife Nancy Stokey, but. They describe why, why research grants to universities are not the best way to develop all different types of ideas. Because they, they said, well, imagine that all music that we could listen to was produced by academic departments of music on, on college campuses. If you ever listen to what music people write when they do research on, on music, yeah. uh, it's often pretty unlistenable stuff. So, uh, so the pure university research grant kind of path isn't necessarily the way I want to get the, the music I listen to or the books I read. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, if you had kind of things like open source, there is a kind of a democratic element where people in open source have to cater to, or lots of the things on the web that are free, they're catering to not just a narrow group of peers, but to a wider audience. And that 
that creates incentives for people to create things that are valuable for large numbers rather than for small, uh, small elites. Speaking of music, do you think uh, the incentives for music creativity right now are pretty healthy? Or do you think they've been damaged by uh, Napster and the parts of the web that, we, that have not been controlled? You know, Wendy mm -hmm. says it's well, mm -hmm. all well and good to theorize about the right optimal mix, but yeah. the market it forces are going to sometimes overwhelm the policy, uh, the ideal policy, no matter what. And what are your thoughts on the music world? Any thoughts? Yeah. Um, I, I'm an amateur here. I have not studied the, um, the economics of this industry very well, but I like music. My sense is that I wish there was more competition in the discovery and promotion of, of new talent. I wish it was easier for new talent to get, a, uh, get heard mm -hmm. and uh, for people to become uh, aware of them. I think the web has great promise for encouraging that. And we're, we're moving away from a system where a small number of record labels have yeah. such, such predominant influence. The record labels and the radio stations still seem to have a huge impact in this area, though. Yeah, so, they're the primary filters. I'm surprised yeah. iTunes isn't a record label. I don't know well, why I, that's, that's exactly, that hasn't happened. I guess they're busy. they yeah, got a lot so, of stuff they're working on, but I think that'll yeah. happen. So, so when, I, when I think about would stronger property rights on music be good or bad, I always pass it through the filter of will it actually create more competition in this business of discovering new talent and getting them out there. Yeah. And so iTunes succeeded partly because they have some property rights. It's a better form of property rights than the old CD form, but they have right. some property rights. And iTunes, I keep thinking, why don't they just become a label and just discover new talent and become the, the And they do to some extent, but not yeah. the way, not the traditional way. Maybe it will never happen in the traditional way now. Yeah. Uh, but so, so I'm, I'm not alarmed at all by kind of the de facto weakening of property rights in the music business because it's become so much easier to, to copy, the, uh, copy the music. But on the other hand, I, also, I, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that Apple figured out a way to create some property rights on music. And I hope... I hope what happens is that people like Apple end up kind of shaking up that business and we see uh, lots more entry and uh, turnover both in artists and in record labels. It also, I think, one of the unintended uh, results of this is it's put a premium on live music mm -hmm. um, because you can still make, you can still close the doors of the concert hall. Sure. Uh, so there's, there's going to be more touring and other benefits. Yeah. Um, We've interviewed a number of people here on Econ Talk about growth in the past, and some of them point to uh, different causes of growth. Mm -hmm. People specialize in looking at different things. Uh, the role of religion, the mm -hmm. role of cognitive ability, the role of institutions, which we've touched on here. What about those things? Do you, in your mind, do they all work through this? The only, the only thing that matters is whether they enhance ideas or not? Is that the, is that the bottom line? Seems to me it is. I think it's a good bottom line. I, I think that's that's probably right. That, that you know, there's a whole cluster of institutions that influence the incentives for the production and distribution of, of new ideas, and uh, so religious systems can either foster or hinder that that process. Uh, legal systems can do that. Cultural norms can can do that. Uh, so a collection of institutions that encourage the production and distribution of ideas will uh, combined with a flourishing market system that part of the distribution process on new ideas, think of Walmart again. Cross-docking might have been invented by some university researchers, but if there wasn't somebody out there who built the distribution centers and built the stores and got the shirts to people, um, it, wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been very valuable. So institutions that encourage the dis dis discovery and then distribution of new ideas alongside of a uh, market system with lots of competition, that's what we want. And the question is, how do you? There many. There may be many different paths towards those those kinds of those kinds of systems, but that's ultimately what where we want to uh, where we want to end up. What's the role of trade, in particular international trade, in oh, this conversation? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Now think about think about a, a developing country, for example. There are two, at least two, fairly different paths that some nations have used to try and get get a hold of ideas that exist in the rest of the world. Some places like China and Singapore relied very heavily on direct foreign investment. Foreign corporations, you know a lot of great stuff. Bring that stuff in, use it with our local talent, and let's, let's produce some goods. Um, some other nations, Japan, uh, South Korea, tried to use domestic firms and uh, some licenses, but mostly domestic copying and in domestic incentives for uh, copying ideas that existed in the rest of the world. Now, 
it, it turns out that South Korea has actually done pretty well. You know, uh, Singapore did pretty well too. So there's not a, 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 a decisive answer about is direct foreign investment the best system or, or not. I I tend to think direct foreign investment is actually a good system, but it's it's clearly not a good essential. system for the nations that for, that yeah. attract it. And for a place like China, it's been phenomenally effective way for them to bring in all kinds of knowledge that might have taken them a long time to develop, rediscover on their own. But but still, there are some nations that have done pretty well without allowing much direct foreign investment. So what matters in those nations is, are they finding ways to produce, uh, to, to take advantage of, to use in production state-of-the-art ideas? The, the one thing we know that doesn't work is like India 20 or 30 years ago, where they let um, some car manufacturers from Britain come in, then they threw up trade barriers and said, okay, you manufacturers can continue to produce those cars you brought in, protected from the rest of the world. Well, the same darn cars were produced for 30 years with no change while all the rest of the world was getting better cars. There was no, no incentives, no structure that led to improvement in the ideas and the use of, of new ideas. So, uh, so yeah, there are multiple paths towards getting all nations in the world using state-of-the-art ideas and discovering new ideas. Um, but interaction with the rest of the world through, through trade seems to be an extremely powerful uh, one. But the critics of international trade would argue that multinational corporations exploit the nations that they, uh, who host them. What's mm -hmm. your answer to that? I think that's, that's just a misunderstanding. If you look at a worker in a Nike factory in, in Vietnam, that worker is is worse off, has a lower quality of life than a worker in the United States. And, and that that feels wrong to many of us. And and that's that's a that's a reasonable kind of moral or ethical response. It's it's sad that there are people who live lives that aren't as nice as ours. But that's not the question here. The question is, did Nikes coming in make the life of that person better off or worse off? And the unambiguous answer is that Nike coming in really helps that person and helps many other people in that in that country. So the fact that they're still worse off than we are is not a sign that Nike's doing something wrong. It's just the, the fact the, it's a sign of the fact that they're starting from a very low level. But if you look at the change through entry of somebody like Nike, it's unambiguously positive for these people. Now, oh. You probably know I agree with you on that. Um, and I know our listeners know that I agree with you on that. What's the mechanism? Does Nike improve the life of that worker out of kindness or competition forcing them to? Oh, I think it's overwhelmingly com competition. There, there's, there's sometimes a little bit of pressure which makes them do basically charitable giving. But, but the real factor, if you look in China right now or India right now, why are firms who are foreign firms that are operating in China and India or, if even, or Vietnam, why are they paying workers more than they used to? What happened was it wasn't just Nike that came in. Right. The, the government let in a lot of other firms. All of those firms started to compete for the best talent there in the nation. And that process of competition started to drive up ideas. So you definitely... Drive up wages. Yeah, drive, sorry, drive up wages. So you don't want to use the Indian strategy of saying, okay, we'll let in one big firm, and then we're drawing up, pulling up the drawbridges. And you know, you can, you can do whatever you want. What you want to do is open it up and say, hey, any firm that wants to come in, go for it. Compete as hard as you can to get, get our best workers. And uh, that'll reward the workers who have the best skills. It'll give incentives for those other workers to acquire skills. And it'll give them opportunities to do things with their skills that they couldn't have otherwise done. In what sense are those workers exploiting or taking advantage of or using the knowledge that that multinational has? I, I love that idea. I'd like to hear you talk about that. Yeah. What, do you, what do you mean well, exactly? Well, so, so Nike's discovered a recipe for taking rubber and cloth and a few other things and then creating something that people value in the United States for at a price of, you know, $100. They can take raw materials worth probably pennies and create something that I might go to the store and pay $100 for. Now, to, to create that additional value, they have to go out and find somebody who does the rearranging according to their, their recipe. If they could get somebody at an extremely low wage to do that rearranging, then um, they, they'd pay that low wage. But then over time, what they find is they're competing with other people and they have to start to pay higher and higher wages to get people to do that, that rearranging. Now, if there are lots of people like Nike trying to find workers to do high value rearranging tasks, they'll be willing to pay quite a bit as they compete with each other. 
But imagine, imagine that Nike only had ideas that could produce things that were worth, say, $10. And Nike could never afford to pay, and its competitors could never afford to pay very high wages to get people to rearrange something to make something worth $10. But when they're making something that's worth $100, they'll compete and ultimately start to pay higher and higher wages. So the fact that they've got an idea, a recipe, that can create quite a bit of value means that they'll pay quite a bit to, to have somebody follow that recipe. If there's lots of people out there with good recipes competing for workers, they'll bid up those wages. And in a sense, part of the value that Nike creates will get uh, um, get sort of, in some sense, sort of taken away by those by those workers, and taken in a way in a way that we feel you know is is kind of good for uh, the world as a whole. I mean, it's good that uh, workers throughout the world will in the future will have higher wages than they uh, than they have now. One last thought on trade, and, and then I want to ask you a final question. The, um, you say at the end of endogenous technological change that human capital, that is know-how, knowledge, it's a bunch of subtle stuff along with basic cognitive skills. Mm -hmm. Human capital is more important than population, that we focused a lot on the size of the market in thinking about growth and not enough mm -hmm. about it's a bad word, but the quality of the market, mm -hmm. one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Certainly the, the, the things that come along with the people, the knowledge. And you say something very profound, which is that, that India and China, which are very large, uh, you'd think that they'd get all the benefits of trade internally. Mm -hmm. I think this is what you say anyway. You have to correct me if I'm wrong. And, and I think about this a lot with the United States. You know, the United States is a very large country. So it's, it's tempting to say that we capture a lot of the advantages that traditionally economists mm. attribute to trade, comparative advantages. There's enough diversity here. The trade's not that important for us. Yeah. But your argument suggests that that misses something yeah. profound. Talk oh, about yeah. that. Yeah, so this is, this is thinking about these non-rival goods, these things like oral rehydration therapy that everybody can use if one person discovers it, gives a very different rationale for why free trade, worldwide free trade, global free trade, can be so so powerful. Um, it's not just that they have different endowments of, of physical goods from our our endowments. Of physical goods. Yeah, stuff. So we you know we have a sunny climate. You've got a rainy climate. Let's trade sunny goods that grow in sunny climates with goods that grow in rainy climates. What we're dealing with now is this discovery process. So imagine imagine that there are um, those. The whole world in 50 or 100 years looks a lot like California, that a large fraction of the population worldwide is out busy trying to discover things. Take a particular industry, biotechnology. You're talking about a very small part of California, <laughs> the part that the, we're no, near no. right now. You mean the intellectually... Uh... Well, but I mean, suppose, suppose the world looks like, like California. So it has, it has agriculture parts okay. and it has you know, <laughs> service centers, but it also has a vibrant you know, biotechnology center. Okay. So every country in the world has some vibrant biotechnology centers. If if we trade with the entire world and we can take advantage of any new drug discovered anywhere in the world, we're much more likely to come up with, say, a treatment for Alzheimer's or some, you know, some really valuable uh, good than if we have to just discover it our, ourselves. That as more and more people are engaged in discovery, the odds of, of any particular discovery or the odds of valuable discoveries uh, go up. So we'd really do ourselves a disservice if we cut ourselves off and said, OK, California is big enough to trade with, we don't need to trade with the rest of the world. Or the United States is big enough to trade with, we don't need to trade with the rest of the world. That uh, already important things are being discovered in other parts of the world, and we can take advantage of those if we engage in trade uh, uh, with people who, who discover those things. So these articles that talk about the threat mm -hmm. of, of 200 million Indian engineers or Indi 200 million mm -hmm. Indian software designers to yeah. our prosperity, kind of missing the boat. Yeah, or, or even worse, like, the, you know, the threat to our biotechnology industry if everybody else develops a biotechnology industry. So what do we care about? We don't care about right. whether our biotechnology industry makes a profit. What we care about is whether we have a drug that treats Alzheimer's for I somebody who, uh, who might otherwise have a, a miserable quality of life. So, uh, um, and and it's, it's, it, this sounds similar to the usual rationale for trade, but it's really quite, quite different. That the, the, the emphasis on the importance of non-rival goods means that there are gains from scale, from, tra uh, from trading with uh, bigger and bigger markets that don't, 
that don't max that don't uh, max out. That you keep getting more and more benefits from having more more people to trade with. And and what's interesting is is that we also get more benefits if they're more like us. Like it's not bad for us if they all look like uh, California. With actually with one exception, which is that I'm sure people will be thinking about now, which is that right now we we pollute in California. You know, we emit a lot of stuff and we don't get charged for emitting carbon dioxide. If they start to live like us, they'll do more of that too. So there will be more pollution. So there, there's reasons why governments should try and stop pollution. We know that. But but if as long as the governments keep pollution under control, uh, we'll all be better off if they're uh, if they're more like us. Well, I don't know. Often, I, I think if they're more like us, they're going to pollute a lot less. I mean, if China's economy, if China well, had our standard of living, they they have a demand good. for cleaner air. We'd be. And then all those meta ideas that we're mm-hmm. going to come up with on how to get people to yeah. discover ways to make the air cleaner. Yeah. To me, the only thing, I just wish there were more engineers on Jupiter, but, you know, <laughs> to outsource stuff too, but, you know, what can you do? Yeah. Uh, my last question, I think, is rhetorical, but I'll ask you anyway. Um, are you optimistic about the future? Are there limits to growth? Oh, I, you know, I've been an, an optimist for um, ever since I got started in economics. It, 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 may, it may be just a personality trait, but I, I think it's been reinforced by the the, the research. Um, I started work during the 70s, back in a time when people talked about the limits to growth and real pessimism about our prospects. People were saying that our standard of living wasn't just that we were going to grow more slowly. Our standard of living, they said, was going to collapse. Yep. There's no way we could sustain it. And they, those kinds of pessimistic forecasts have been made ever since the time of Malthus, and they've always been wrong. The historical pattern has been one of accelerating growth, not just sustained growth, but accelerating growth. I think that's, uh, that process can continue throughout our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes, and uh, uh, the world will just be a much better place uh, because of it. So I'm, I am pretty optimistic. I hope we both live to 200 to see it. Right. We, just, we need somebody to discover that, that pill that uh, makes sure that we're not only alive, but we're actually functionally, you know, mentally competent. When, and, you know. Yeah, and with those artificial hips and knees we'll have, we'll be playing tennis at 170. Yeah. My guest today has been Paul Romer, the Stanko 25 Professor of Economics in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University and a Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Thank you, Paul. Great. Thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.